So um, some symptom profiles of IBS patients to the point, 407 IBS patients, 36% um, had something called allodynia, which is the triggering of pain response from stimuli that don't normally cause pain. 52% suffered from anxiety, 24% had depression, 20% had at least three psychopathologic factors, 30% had two, 31% had one. The increase in severity of IBS symptoms and decrease in quality of life changes in response to the number of psychopathological factors involved, all right? So there's a direct correlation between how much you're experiencing in terms of psychopathologic uh, influence and pain, all right? Patients with psychological issues report more frequent and more disabling symptoms than controls. Those who seek medical care report to their doctors more feelings of panic and depression and anxiety, uh, hypochondriasis than controls. And some report suicidal ideation and suicide attempts due to their IBS. It can be that miserable. There's a higher incidence of physical and sexual abuse reported by IBS patients. Again, it's not that it's in your head, it's in your gut but your psychological state has a lot to do with how you experience what's going on in your gut. And now you can understand what I was saying before. If you don't understand this, you're gonna do a lot of wrong things that don't help the IBS patient at all. The gut microbiome definitely has an influence. A meta-analysis of 24 studies, there were very specific um, bacteria associated with the gut microbiome of IBS patients versus controls. Um, and so you see a lot more of, of there's, a, there's a particular makeup. And I'm not saying that you should all go get stool samples in response to this um, if you have IBS, but it is an argument for using good diet and probiotics in order to restore the gut microbiome to its normal state because it generally is in an abnormal state for the um, person who is experiencing IBS and symptoms. Um, changes in the microbiome uh, can, can influence the gut, which can make a person more susceptible to IBS. Shorter duration of breastfeeding is correlated with an increased risk. And um, again, the fecal microbiome is different for the two. So you see less diversity, less fecal diversity, and less bifidobacterium and lactobacillus, which are master strains that influence the development of the gut. And you see more pathogenic bacteria. Um, 23 pre-adolescent children and 22 healthy controls. The microbiomes of the IBS patients were different even in, in uh, children. There was a significant association between a specific composition. In other words, it's another one of those correlation things when we talked about path pathopsychology, the more of those factors you have, the worse the symptoms, the same thing is true here. Um, the bigger the abnormality in the microbiome, the more associated, the higher the level of uh, pain and the severity of pain. Um, Dr. Thomas Almy was one of the first doctors to propose a connection between the brain and the GI tract, which he was the person who termed it the gut-brain axis. Um, in early research, he performed all kinds of diagnostics uh, and recorded the respiratory rate, heart rate, blood pressure, number of contractions of the colon. And what he saw, what he was able to observe is if he gave these patients stressful information, all this stuff would increase. And so um, the bottom line is that, um, is again, um, the IBS patient has real symptoms that are uh, influenced by emotions. Now, does diet have any role in any of this? It does, but I'll tell you what, in my early days, 26 years ago, trying to help people like this, I thought it was all about diet. In fact, one of the limitations of the way I started my business was that I sort of, um, I got in the habit, it was kind of some bad influence, I think, really kind of thinking diet solved everything. And it solves a lot. I mean, my personal experience was that it did. And that's part of the problem. A good scientist moves beyond personal experience and gets into looking at the totality of what's there. But, but um, I thought that this was a problem that could be solved with diet. And diet sometimes is a factor. Um, some people have very limited tolerance for fat and it often causes all kinds of problems ranging from uh, slow movement of material through the gastrointestinal tract to bloating and distension to preferentially feeding pathogenic bacteria. So fat's a problem. And um, the IBS patient may, in addition to some of the psychological factors and the visceral hypersensitivity I mentioned, the IBS patient actually might be suffering from, uh, from dietary problems, uh, things that need to be addressed as well. 
Uh, fructose and fructans can be poorly absorbed in IBS patients. Um, fructans are reported to exacerbate symptoms like abdominal pain and, and bloating in a subset of patients with IBS, but it really wasn't in, in, in actually controlled studies. It hasn't been, uh, you ha we haven't been able to make a clear connection. Fruits, foods that are high in fructans, however, are wheat, onions, shallots, garlic, barley, cabbage, broccoli, pistachio, artichoke, chicory root, and asparagus. So those are foods that you might wanna stay away from if you're an IBS patient and you think you're susceptible to um, fructan sensitivity. But I wanna say this, this is another thing, and this helped me in my journey to figure this all out early on when I was working with people, is one of the hallmark symptoms uh, or signs of um, the IBS patient is that dietary improvement of almost any type, almost any diet that these people adopt will make them feel better for a while and then it goes away. There's a placebo effect that um, seems to make things better for a while and then they go back to baseline again. And so um, I've seen many cases, I've, I've had people come in here who've had IBS for a long, long time. And then, um, They'll, and they'll say, well, I tried this and I tried that and I eliminated this and then somebody told me I should eliminate that. And at the end of the day, what they're really telling you is for 20 years, I've been trying to find a food or group of foods or whatever that's causing this and there hasn't really been anything. And uh, so sometimes that type of experimentation has gone on before they get here. Sometimes the experimentation goes on while they're here, but in any case, um, that's one theory about it all. In terms of the prognosis, uh, IBS is a chronic relapsing recurring disorder with recurrent symptoms of varying severity. The life expectancy is the same as the general population. It does not increase mortality risk. Um, it does increase the risk of ectopic pregnancy and miscarriage. The biggest thing and the reason why you wanna solve it is it's just not a fun way to live. So I don't know any IBS patients who enjoy the state of health that they're in and the feelings that they have. So that's why you wanna fix it. But it's not, you know, unlike cancer, unlike diabetes, unlike inflammatory bowel disease, it doesn't have the potential to actually shorten your life. Uh, flares can last from a few days to several months. Keeping a diary can help patients to determine what their triggers are and they're either life events or psychological states. They vary from person to person, but there's a consistent pattern for each person. Like when this happens, this IBS phenomenon results and it's very consistent. Long-term, 70% of people report that it continues, but patients at academic centers tend to be a little bit sicker than others and the general community. So it might be that, that that's part of the reason why. Um, everybody experiences symptoms differently. For some symptoms resolve or become less intense and for others it persists over a lifetime. But it, there is no evidence to really suggest that it progresses to more serious things over time except just you know, more discomfort because people get sick of it. I want to say something in case I forget to say it later, or there's not an opportunity. Um, I've read books by people who claim to have IBS and just changed their diet and it all went away. And my contention is that they didn't have IBS. It was one of those things where they were constipated or they had gastrointestinal symptoms that went away when they changed their diet because it didn't involve all this other stuff that I'm telling you. This is classic IBS. I'm constipated and it went away when I changed my diet. That is not IBS. Or I had gas and it went away when I changed, that's not IBS. 